Right now on The Daily Debrief, in Wisconsin, the words of a girl held captive for 88 days ring in a courtroom. He thought that he could make me like him, but he was wrong. As prosecutors ask for life without parole for her abductor. Also in South Carolina, a man who killed his five kids claims insanity. Does an old brain injury give him an excuse? Plus, in California, a former NFL player faces accusations of sex crimes. I kept on saying, ow, 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 ow. We break down the testimony of three accusers. Real-life criminal cases are on The Daily Debrief. It's Friday, May 24th. Welcome to the debrief, everybody. We've got a lot to talk about, so let's get straight to it. It is life in prison without parole for the Wisconsin man who admitted to murdering the parents of a young teenager he wanted to abduct and keep for himself. Jake Patterson pleaded guilty to murder charges so he could get his case over with. He admitted he barged into the home of 13-year-old Jamie Claus, killed her parents, and took her to his cabin miles away. There he kept her hidden while hundreds searched and wondered. Kloss broke free after 88 days in captivity and ran for help. We begin with the words of Jamie Kloss herself being read by an attorney. I don't want to even see my home or my stuff because of the memory of that night. My parents and my home were the most important things in my life. He took them away from me in a way that will always leave me with a horrifying memory. I have to have an alarm on the house now just so I can sleep. I used to love to go out with my friends. I loved to go to school. I loved to do dance. He took all of those things away from me too. It's too hard for me to go out in public. I get scared and I get anxious. These are just ordinary things that anyone like me should be able to do, but I can't because he took them away from me. But there are some things that Jake Patterson can never take from me. He can't take my freedom. He thought that he could own me, but he was wrong. I was smarter. I watched his routine and I took back my freedom. I will always have my freedom and he will not. Jake Patterson can never take away my courage. He thought he, control, he could control me, but he couldn't. I feel like what he did is what a coward would do. I was brave and he was not. He could never take away my spirit. He thought that he could make me like him, but he was wrong. He can't ever change me or take away who I am. He can't stop me from being happy and moving forward with my life. I will go on to do great things in my life, and he will not. He should stay locked up forever. Other relatives had these words for the judge. I remember the night after it happened and we were at home and we had to go to bed. I have never in my life been so scared. I was scared to death for my, my siblings. I was scared to death for my kids. I was scared to death for everybody because we didn't know. For 88 days, we had to listen to people speculate, people talk about your family, and we didn't know. We didn't know who was involved, if we were in danger. How do you go to bed at night knowing, is she hungry? Is she scared? And I think as a family, like they said, it goes in your brain and it never stops. You can never, you never not think about it. And it's, it's, it's devastating. Um, my kids lost an aunt and uncle. My nieces and nephews lost. My brothers lost their best friend. Thank God, after those 88 days, we at least got answers. We were able to put the pieces together, and one person did that. That was my niece. She saved our family. She put the pieces together, and now we need to, we need to, move on. And judge, we ask that the family ask that you, like the lady said before, to please sentence him to life in prison on both sentences consecutively with no possibility of parole. 
we have to be able to go to sleep at night knowing that our niece is finally safe and that nobody else can be hurt. The prosecutor said that even though Jake Patterson pleaded guilty, the judge should never allow Patterson the chance to get out of prison. The prosecutor said the public and, of course, Jamie Kloss herself needed that protection. He's not sorry for kidnapping Jamie and murdering her parents. He's sorry that he got caught. Detective Nelson observed that the only time Mr. Patterson became emotional when he confessed to murdering James and Denise and kidnapping Jamie was when he asked if he would spend the rest of his life in prison. The defendant will stop at nothing to get what he wants if he is ever released from prison. The need to protect the public starts with Jamie. If Mr. Patterson is ever released from prison, he will find Jamie. And when he does, her life will be in jeopardy. That was one of several times where the defendant acted up during the sentencing hearing. So attorneys David Katz, law and crime president Rachel Stockman here with me tonight. Good to see you both. Great to see you. Seems to me that this is justice, though, the chance that he won't get out of prison, because I agree with the prosecutor here, David, that there's a chance he would try to track this family down again. Well, I think that as a former prosecutor myself, that's exactly the argument that I would have made. I think if I were a judge, that's the sentence that I would have imposed because public safety really is paramount here. The question that I have is whether this really was the best way to have handled the defense. Even someone like him, even someone that the judge characterized as the embodiment of evil, deserves to have the best defense that they possibly can have, even though it was with public funds. And I think the idea that by going to a trial, by saving a trial, that somehow he was going to get a reduction of his sentence or he was going to get the possibility of parole, that seemed to me very unrealistic. Yeah, but surely, I mean, look, he wanted to avoid the trial, so the attorneys had to do what the client asked for, Rachel. Right. Well, I, I, you know, just as a human, I was a little bit offended by the defense attorney's claims here, basically saying, well, you know, you should sentence him to life with the possibility of parole. We know he's going to die in prison, but we want him access to some mental health services, but we don't really know what his mental health problem is, but clearly someone that would do this has a mental health problem. That was basically their argument. Obviously, it didn't sway the judge, and honestly, to a layperson, a civilian, probably a community member uh, watching this, it probably didn't go over so well either. They've got to do what they've got to do for their client, but again, it didn't sway the judge at all. Bottom line, this guy is locked up. The key's being thrown away. Hate to repeat the old euphemism, but that's the way it is. We'll check in with you both later on in the broadcast. A man accused of murdering his five kids pressed his insanity defense today in a South Carolina courtroom. Timothy Jones Jr. could be executed if jurors find him guilty. He admits taking the lives of his children ages one through eight and then driving around with their bodies in the back of his Cadillac SUV for more than a week. A parade of defense doctors provided testimony about whether a brain injury from an old car crash affected the defendant's behavior. So could somebody with the brain impairments that you've seen on these scans go to college? Sure. They uh, get a job? Sure. And be a computer engineer? Sure. Um, are you saying that you would expect to find no issues with a person with this type of brain pathology? No, uh, I would expect you would find uh, issues. But what's important is to understand that brain injury really needs to be, in, be viewed in three compartments. One is a physical compartment <clears throat> where it may produce motor and sensory uh, uh, deficits, may also produce particular symptoms like headaches, dizziness, epilepsy, et cetera. So that's the physical side. Then there's a cognitive side. So the injury may affect cognition. And then there's an emotional side. So you have these three compartments, physical, emotional, and cognitive. The brain injury such as we see here is going to affect behavior, behaviors that global umbrella overall aspect that I'm talking about. Is it going to be in the motor compartment? Is it going to be in the emotional compartment? Is it going to be in the cognitive compartment? Is it going to be some of all parts? What is it? That is related in part to the individual differences that occur when someone is injured. 
But an injury such as this is going to have an effect. You don't have this kind of injury and it not alter behavior in some fashion. The defendant's pastor even testified that Timothy Jones would sometimes fly off the handle or believe strange things. You told me in the past the difference between what you said is calm Tim and not calm Tim. Can you explain to the jury that difference? Tim had two sides. One minute he would be calm, listening, open, engaged. If you said mentioned something to him, he would hear you, respond to you. But then he had another side of him that once that kicked in, uh, it was very difficult to, to have any kind of legitimate communication with him. Uh, he would say to me sometimes whenever he would start getting frustrated and it's, it seemed to uh, escalate when pressure was on or what have you. And uh, he would say, it seems like there's a monster inside of me trying to get out and I don't know how to stop it. When that was going on, there was, it was very difficult to communicate with him, and whatever you, whatever was, whatever I would say to him, would not often be heard or received, and it was, it was as if almost I, there's no point in, in talking at all uh, at that particular time, you know, until he calmed down again. A marriage and family therapist also testified for the defense that she noticed two sides to Timothy Jones. So on the night, did y'all talk about the, the monster again? We did. He said that the monster wanted control, uh, and control in the context of knowing more about what was going on while he was at work. And he wanted information, uh, and when he said when he there was a deficit of information that the monster would come out. What, if anything, do you say about Amber's response to, to that part of that? He said that she told him that she can't be near him when the monster comes out. Did you have some suggestions for him on dealing with the monster on the night? I did. We talked about, uh, since Tim is incredibly bright, so for him to be able to kind of externalize this monster and talk about the attachment that was uh, driving, the attachment uh, wounds that were driving this monster, uh, we talked about externalizing it further and how that was more of his child self. Like his adult self is the person sitting in the room with me, being very present and having a mature conversation and being able to externalize this monster that was more like that wounded child self. And so uh, we talked about um, shutting down the uh, that internal dialogue. Uh, he, he did use the word voices that the monster had, you know, would, would talk to him. Um, we all have those internal voices that, um, it, based on all of our experiences, talk to us and, and, you know, they talk to us much worse than we would talk to um, anybody else, usually even an enemy. So uh, we talked about him redirecting the uh, monster and having that inner child cared for with the adult voice, shutting down that voice so his rational and logical voice could come in. The jury in the Jones case will have three options, guilty, guilty but mentally ill, or not guilty by reason of insanity. Each option results in different incarceration options for the judge. A not guilty plea to report in the case of a Colorado fiance reported missing around the holidays last year. Patrick Frazee will now face a jury in the presumed death of Kelsey Barrett. The trial is set for late October. Another woman said to be Frazee's girlfriend, Crystal Lee Kenny, claims she was involved before and after Barrett's death. Still ahead on the debrief today, the case of a former NFL player accused of a series of sex crimes. We head back to the courthouse, this time in California, after the break. Welcome back to The Debrief. Testimony will resume Monday in the trial of a former NFL player accused of sex crimes with five women ranging in age from 17 to 77. Kellen Winslow II played 10 seasons with the Cleveland Browns and other teams. He faces 12 charges some in multiple counts. The maximum penalty, if convicted, is life with the chance for parole. Winslow's accusers are known as Jane Doe's one through five. 
Three have testified so far. When he inserted his penis, it hurt so bad. That is the voice, and these are the hands of Jane Doe number one. Yes, I kept on saying, ow, 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 because I don't know how he fit that thing in there. The 54-year-old woman testified that she was a transient and was hitchhiking when a man approached her in his vehicle on March 17th, 2018. And then all of a sudden he goes, I'm not going to take you to a Vulcan, I'm going to take you to the store and f you. She went to the police four days later despite threats. He's like, no, no way, I'll kill you. When you told him to pull over and let you out at the hospital, did he say that he would kill you? Yes, he said that he, he was going to get this done. The account of Jane Doe number one led to three charges against Kellen Winslow II, kidnapping, forced rape, and forced oral sex. The defense reminded her that she previously identified one of the attorneys rather than the defendant as her attacker. And that's still the person who raped you? No, it's the one next to you, yeah. him. In the prelim, you were pretty sure about it. Okay, right. just a moment. She also failed to accurately describe the suspect's vehicle. You were... Fairly positive it was a Jeep because you read J E E P. Remember that? I told yes. That. And you were positive that it was a two door. Do you remember that? Because you told that to the police. All right. And you were also positive that there were no back seats because you told that to the police also. Do you remember that? Yes. yes, then it must have been a Jeep. You're right. Authorities found Winslow's DNA on Jane Doe number one's pants. The defense says sex occurred, but says it was consensual. And the blood Jane Doe number one said resulted from the alleged rape? Yes, I was menstruating. The blood that we're talking about here was from menstruating rather than being penetrated and assaulted, correct? Yes, yes, sir. Still, this Jane Doe says the sex was not consensual. And now okay. to another accuser. Jane Doe number two is 59 years old and described herself as homeless when she says the defendant offered her a ride on May 13th, 2018. She reported the next day that he allegedly committed forcible rape and sodomy by force. He like held me, grabbed my arms, and um, I, I don't know what else he said, but we're, he says we're going to have sex. And I said, please don't do this. And um, I said it about four times, and um, something like, a, it's a done deal, you know, and... Um, so Ms. Doe, let me ask you about that. So uh, when you say that you said, please don't do this, you think you said that about four times? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And when you say they were held, you're clasping your hands together. Did he actually place his hands on your forearms and hold your arms together? He, he hold my hands together, I don't, yeah. Tell us what he actually did on the side of the car when you were in the passenger seat. Um, well, he had me take my pants off and, um, and pulled me on front of the seat and, and started to, you know, and, um, So Ms. Doe, I have to ask you, when you say that he started to, you know, what did he actually do? You know, started to rape me. Jane Doe number three provided her account of yet another alleged crime. Jesse Weber brings us that testimony. At that moment, I said, no, 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 no. And then I walked away. 57-year-old Jane Doe number three spoke through an interpreter and appeared to be shaken emotionally as she told jurors that a man she believes to be Kellen Winslow II exposed himself on her property in May 2018. <laughs> I saw him, I was walking toward the orange tree, and then he was following me. And then he took his pants and then exposed his penis to me. She testified that a man approached her home a month prior on a bicycle and introduced himself. He told her his name was David and said he lived just up the street. Their second alleged meeting was more troubling. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. When you saw his penis, was it erect? Uh, yes. Did he touch himself? Yes, he used his hand to uh, hold the penis. This Jane Doe said she didn't look at her alleged attacker's face because her culture doesn't encourage looking strangers in the eye. 
She spoke with the police that same day and described the man as dark-skinned, athletic, with curly hair and tattoos on both arms. But she gave the wrong height. And you said that it was an adult male, five feet, eight inches tall, short hair and medium build, right? Yes, sir. Because that's what she told you, right? Yeah. The account of Jane Doe number three resulted in a charge of indecent exposure against Kellen Winslow II. It alone could carry a fine of $1,000 and up to six months behind bars. For Law and Crime, I'm Jesse Weber. Attorney David Katz is here along with Law and Crime President Rachel Stockman. So, Rachel, the big question is, are these accusers believable? Well, it really does come down to credibility, and you really have to look each at, at each of the Jane Doe's separately. Um, I think Jane Doe number one, uh, the defense team did a very good job during the cross-examination at poking holes on her story. Jane Doe number two and Jane Doe number three, who we've heard from so far, I think they had credible stories. But again, the jurors are looking at the totality of this and they're saying, wait a second here, something is very similar in all of these cases. And I'm sure jurors can't get past that. I would agree with that as well. And that's, of course, David, why prosecutors want to lump everything together. But there's a couple of things that they're not being allowed to lump into this trial. We've got five accusers, but theoretically there are more. Well, as a criminal defense attorney, what um, you're referring to, Rachel, as the totality is what we think is an overlap where they'd convict almost anybody. They bring in five bad acts, you know, what they did with Bill Cosby. They brought in so many bad acts that after a while, at least from a criminal defense attorney's point of view, it seemed like it was very difficult for the jurors to focus on any particular one. So you had some of them that were almost but not quite. And that's what I'm worried about here, that there are some almost but not quites. Now, the judge has kept out two or three potential witnesses. The judge is going to take a look at whether that's what we call in the federal system 404B down the road, or if the defense puts on a case, the defense might actually put on a case that would make those become relevant to rebut the defense that's been put on. So that may be in Winslow's hands whether those other allegations come in, but there are even further alleged victims uh, beyond those five that are slated to testify for the prosecution. It turns into a slippery slope when you start to lump everything together. Of course, the defense has to be careful, as you said, not to open that door up to bring in some of those other acts he's alleged to have committed. Rachel, David, appreciate your insight on the debrief tonight. That's going to wrap it up for us this week. We'll see you back here on Monday, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good weekend.